and we have had a number of internet interruptions. So if I disappear, mm -hmm. uh, don't take it personally. It's just the internet's gone. Uh, but so far, it's been fairly stable the last couple of hours. So uh, yeah, over to you. All right, all right. So <clears throat> let me do it proper. Um, since I think there's a few guests uh, changing, but at length we have, including me, we have four. So mm -hmm. we have Kim, we have yep. uh, Xiao Yin, and my name is Lewis. So today's topic is about digital uh, governing the platform economic economies. So I'm not trying to repeat the question. I think it's go through the the strategy you can tackle and also uh, what happens so we use the governing, okay? Government governing the, the, the platform. I think it's a very broad topic. And I think um, because we have the founding members, like the D founder of the Wonder World, I mean, it actually is quite nice for me to start with her comparing Zoom, comparing Tencent meeting, even compare, comparing team from Microsoft. Yeah. Okay. And also recent incident, incident that LinkedIn get actually separated from China. I'm, I've been so troubled. I need to move anything because I'm from Hong Kong, right? So... I, I, I actually like China, like Hong Kong, Singapore. So my profile get stored in the China database. Okay. I have to change the entire thing and not until I deleted my simplified Chinese profile and I can be visible in the American based database. So I, I have another citizenship too. So I have to change the location to Singapore in order to maintain my data. So I would say platform okay let me start it first okay everyone have to the bio bibliography already i'm not trying to repeat who i am but i think right now platform okay internet data is also like a privatization okay the the debate between public good and private good okay so china is already doing quite well but because the data itself is started too early so hong kong singapore i think the data privacy it's not an issue, okay? Com a merchant cannot capitalize of using uh, personal data, but in China, like look at Alibaba, Tmall, every actually every big technology company try to privatize data. So I would rather start with this conversation by looking into the data privacy plus the privatization, okay? And then we talk about the strategy to tackle the mobility and also the governance. Okay. Of course, you feel free to use an example because it's always a debate between the liquidity and also the the, the government, right? So, not touching any political issue, but just being making sense of the the usage of the information. Lewis, can you clarify something for me that you just said? Did you say you lost your LinkedIn profile? No, no, no. They, they actually separated the LinkedIn profile for the Chinese own, only for job hunting, but not community sharing. Oh. Okay? It's just like Bling, the search engine for Microsoft, right? So they only do search for news, not making any social or whatever, like um, self-blocking thing, you know, the block. Yeah. And why was that? Mm. Why did that happen? Was that a was that a LinkedIn decision? Well, or I think I think increased using on LinkedIn actually compensating what purpose of Google or Facebook. Okay, Facebook mm -hmm. is a social app, right? So because right now more people speak English in China and more people actually using LinkedIn because they feel like TikTok is not professional enough, and then LinkedIn and actually become a social interaction professional like platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in China, everything has to register, okay? Anything has to register. So even in Singapore too, Singapore, they have a data privacy law so tight. Actually, every email they can scrutinize without actually letting you know, okay? So it, it, it's a public good or private ownership for your personal data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I speak it now because I'm from Hong Kong, so the law didn't dictate me that not to speak, right? So... Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, any 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 kind of welcome because Kim, I, I've heard this is my first time meeting Kim. Perhaps 
you can uh, uh, navigate, mitigate a little bit what you thought about platform, about governance. Okay. Um, what I've done in the past is, is just given like a two minute overview of what I do. So I'm, I'm not from a technology background, so I'll confess all my sins uh, up front. Um, I was born last century. Um, I often say that I've lived in uh, uh, I've lived in seven decades, two centuries, and two millennium, and still the best music came out of the nineteen eighties. But that's a generational comment. Um, uh, so technology is not my forte. What we're in is the small business finance space. We provide trade finance and working capital to to SMEs. In other words, we're a non bank lender. Um, but we use a lot of platforms, obviously, you know, and that's come home to me just in the last week. As I said earlier, we've had major flooding here. So uh, we lost power at our home. I couldn't get to the office. We lost, uh, we lost internet. We lost telephone. Mobile phones were working at best at half capacity for three days and everything ground to a, to, to a halt. And that really brings home to you the reality of, how much we rely on the internet, how much we rely, rely on different platforms. Um, I wasn't sure whether this discussion would be about mainly uh, social platforms like you know, Facebook, Twitter, and the, the political implications there, or whether it was going to be a broader, uh, broader discussion about data privacy and who owns data. Um, I don't have strong opinions on uh, I don't, have, I don't want to express strong opinions on government in, interference. I, I like the rule of law. I like independent liberty. Uh, I don't like the concept of, uh, philosophically, the concept of governments regulating too much. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the time, I think back in, in, in from an American, you're living in the US, uh, who, and, and, and uh, if Standard Oil needed to be broken up all those years ago, Surely some of these large internet platforms need to be broken up with more competition. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I probably really wanted to defer to the CEO of Run the World because she's the one with all experience on platforms. <laughs> um, are you guys all based in, uh, where are you based, uh, Louis, now? I mean, I, I, we're in Australia, Brisbane, ah. Australia. Oh, Kim, you're in Australia, and Louis, you're in Singapore. Well, uh, no, I think I'm in Georgia right now, so... Yeah, I moved my all entire portfolio to Switzerland, uh, Singapore, and also also in yeah some of them in Romania and Ukrainian too, like one years ago. So I based in Hong Kong right now because of quarantine, but the company portfolio itself is yeah U.S., Europe, and Asia Pacific. So. Yeah, consider I'm a Singapore right now <laughs> to be digital. <laughs> LinkedIn right now, so I only pick, ask me to pick one place, so Singapore. So, so to clarify, you, your residency is Hong Kong, you're currently in Hangzhou. Yeah. Is well, I, I grew up and born in Hong Kong, my fourth generation. So, and I, I you, if you look at my LinkedIn, actually, I study quite a lot of places. So, Naturally, I think I guess I, I couldn't I could not find your LinkedIn anymore. I don't know if that's because... see <laughs> it, it's not able to open. So I don't know if it's because the, you change your data to China, maybe that's why I No, I I removed the data in China. <laughs> okay. oh, my god. oh my god. I have to write like the Hoffman, like I make it back to, you know, the <laughs> Mavia. Mm. So yes, yeah, so I am originally Chinese, but I, I'm basically uh, studied here in the U.S. and start a company in the U.S. and everything. Right now, you know, we're just a Delaware-based corporation. Um, we all we do a lot of events um, in in U.S. and as well as Europe and China and and Asia, like other parts of Asia too. Um, and and you know, increasingly, we're seeing from a consumer need perspective, at least in the event space, uh, because of the pandemic, things are going uh, digital. Uh, and a lot of events start to see more international audience coming to those events, uh, which, you know, they may have the series for a few years, but before COVID, there was mostly a physical. So then is people around that region will, will came to that event. Uh, but now, because 
because COVID and because virtual events, uh, more events are seeing more international audience, uh, which mean it, it just not just like you have a event just for your region. It became like everybody, uh, no matter how big or small, can easily host an event with international audience. Um, so I think that's the, the thing we see, uh, which means that as an events platform, uh, we have to be able to support uh, all regions. We can't just say uh, to Frank, who started Horace, say, hey, we can't support people in Asia, right? That's not going to work for them. So, uh, it, which is a, quite of a challenge for, you know, for a company like us, we're three years old. Typically, you could imagine most company when they started, uh, they start region from region. That's kind of like Uber or uh, Airbnb. They start in one region, they expand into other region. Uh, for us, due to the nature of our business, we have to, um, you know, start internationally uh, from day one to provide a viable services uh, for our customers which is, um, I guess this is a new thing. Um, the other thing that, that right now, um, uh, we, we started the company in 2019, it was before COVID, so we had an office, uh, but in 2020, things shut down, uh, and then we, we shut down our office, actually. We started hiring more people uh, internationally, uh, and they all work in their home, uh, and there's no office. And uh, right now, we still don't have an office. We have like you know people in Asia, people in Europe, people in uh, here in the U.S., um, so there's a, a lot, a, also like a new generation of company where you are scaling your companies uh, directly, remotely, uh, and there's no, I guess there's not an issue where people used to hang out in the office, but now they're not anymore. They want to go back. I guess for a company like ours, um, people get to know each other virtually, uh, and the company get uh, expanded virtually. Uh, so now, um, I guess it is impossible for us to say like, let's have an office where everybody is going to be together because of the nature of our business. So I see that there are kind of um, two things maybe that's unique about our business. First, we have to go international from a customer base standpoint from day one, and second of all, you know, all of our employee base, which related to culture, related to employment law, uh, it has to be international from day one as well. Very interesting. So, so, you know, when you have to start internationally, like you just said, do you have, are there any issues with compliance in multiple jurisdictions? Or are you rely, able to rely only on your home jurisdiction, wherever well, that is? It, it basically, you, you do have to follow local rules, right? Like, um, if um, in order for the services to be available in those countries that you have to follow the rules to not get shut down, stuff like that. And, and similarly, in order to uh, pay your employees and making sure you know, they, they perform, you also have to follow uh, respective laws, uh, employment ways. So uh, I guess there's some changes in the tech space right now that I've seen. Uh, one is that there's more services that enable you to scale uh, so, it's, it, for example, for payment, we use Stripe, uh, which handles internationally uh, already. So we don't really need to reinvent the wheel from day one uh, from a payment standpoint. You could imagine similar services in other, uh, maybe like maybe for streaming or maybe for uh, data or maybe for privacy. Uh, there could be other services uh, that they, they offer, uh, you know, platforms or services uh, uh, internationally. So you can just plug and play uh, as a company. Uh, so that that is making things really easy and there's more company doing that uh in addition to employment there's been a bunch of new startups i think one of them raised uh, like a billion dollar something called like deal uh, is a company that now worth like five billion dollar uh it does not exist uh three and a half years ago uh, they basically help you uh handle payment and payroll uh for uh, people you hire internationally so they hire lawyers and they hire uh employment firms uh to handle all the contract handle all the payment uh for people in all those countries and you just need to tell them you know here's the employees and where they're from how much you pay them and they handle everything so uh, i think the thing i'm seeing is like you know we we, we need to rely on those platforms that the half different pieces for out and we uh, and, and and that actually makes it easy and possible for us to do what we're doing right now. What was the name of the firm that that you were just referring to that that uh, that uh, handles employment across jurisdictions? Uh, it's called D E E L Deal. Uh, D E E L. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's quite smart. They have lawyers like all over the world, and they help you. Actually, they will provide you with a template of contract. Uh, unless we hire somebody in China, we hire somebody in, in the UK, they will provide you like a template um, that, that is aligned with local laws and you just like to, you just basically plug and play, tell them you know how much you pay and stuff like that. And they kind of tell you, uh, and they have a compliance team that handles uh, those stuff for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's 
D E E L, right? D E E L. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, let him tell me. So, what was the biggest challenge you faced in starting around the world? Um, well, I, I guess for, for, for us, we um, we started the company in 2019 and, and early 2020, which is probably six months since we started COVID hit, uh, there is a news and we raised some money initially. And then there's a news report saying it would raise some money. But all of a sudden COVID hit and then we start seeing like exploding demand uh, almost like at a time where we we're not fully ready and we kind of being forced to be ready really fast. So um, you could imagine that's quite challenging. Uh, but then at that time, like we have to move fast. Otherwise, you know, those people really need our help right now. Um, so I guess that's a unique challenge that we're seeing. So we have to quickly mm -hmm. hire you know, the team and, and building the international infrastructure that I just described, uh, which can be quite challenging. Uh, and then obviously the other thing is that the events uh, is a new space and 2020, I don't think people have figured out what's the right format. Um, mm -hmm. So they, some of the things that they asked us to build or they, they say that they need turns out and not to be what they actually want, maybe six months down the road. Uh, so basically at that time we had a choice of like, there, here's all the customer need. Uh, maybe some of them we, we think they're not gonna need them in six months, but other others are, are actually valid. So how do you differentiate w w what needs are legitimate in terms of you know investment yeah. for us and what is not? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So Lewis, what do you do? Well, funny thing, I actually, um, when all this name mentioned by uh, Xiao Yin, actually, I've been like either in the, a nominal investor or the co-founder, like okay. namely Tesla, Uber, and UiPath. I started with Group Groupon. I was the youngest uh, C level uh, CEO, there. I COO. I'm a COO of the Greater China. So I expand. I literally do the expansion for Rocket Internet, combining with Group Groupon yeah. in the state. So. It was so brutal because we do it all the thing that mentioned by Z and by menu. Okay. Lawyer, headhunter, expanding. Imagine I expanded 60 city with 300 Ivy League MBA random running. And we actually, we don't have mobile internet. So Groupon is the first generation of mobile internet because before that is still desktop. Okay. So that was the massive, the greater, greatest okay hat hunting expansion craziness in the human history because we hire 30 different hat hunting agency and then expand it because we only use three months to start uh the group on china group on china was only one john venture between alibaba and also japan and also tencent okay so we used three months to launch and then to, to, I mean, the website get launched and then 60 office with four headquarters. So, and also we fire people, not fire. We actually stream down after we go listed. So by, by waging, uh, 100 million USD in return, the share market value, I mean, the listed company with the China, uh, story, they have few hundred million more valuation. So the number, it, it works. Okay. So rocket internet is a notorious, uh, expansion strategy company. So they, they shareholders called European founder. So that's why I started Pacific founder, but I don't think the expansion mode that German is using is healthy because they just burn everything. And then when they go listed, when they exit, you can check the news like rocket internet. They are very notorious and cloning other people in hundred days. So the Groupon in, is called City Deal in, in Europe. The Google, the Facebook, they clone it before. They clone it and then sell it back to the headquarters and change the name. Okay. So it also happened. Okay. So that's why Alibaba, uh, having those like, you know, uh, like marketing business development people, Ditui, you know, the, we call it land pusher. I mean, they don't actually think they just push it. Okay. I train them. So anything like in Alibaba right now, uh, I was supposed to end finance COO, but I turn it down back into one, three, because I think that the, the, the momentum building ecosystem is better for, uh, just expanding a digital platform. So that's why I particularly like run the world because they have a close ecosystem 
actually they they have the flexibility for people. It's like one stop solution for making an event. Look at Frank. Frank is just one guy. He's managed five hundred people with the platform. It's so smart. Okay, just like Singapore, having having a small country actually like mitigate all those different ecosystem, Southeast Asia, China, American, Europe. That is something we need, right? So not completely uh, decentralized, but really effective, self-sustaining, self-governing, like centralized. Okay, this is my idea because last section like the the horace's extraordinary meeting and then the gobro meeting they are very you know the the, the the opinion is very extreme okay yeah we do blockchain and we do bitcoin damn the government and then that's like yeah we need it so so i think being so many people we still have the human part okay while i'm financially independent already so i try to talk to my son or even my family i need to get my soul back damn i've been 10 years doing digitalization so when you expand okay just like the communist or the really advancing standard model it killed the human part okay the luxury of the human part is being random shit you know just random shit talking some stupid thing and but not too many Okay, actually at m and we work too in China. We work, okay, I'm not really sure. We work, the founder is like a fucking Jesus. He talk like a Jesus, okay? So in my translation is a bunch of unemployment people thinking too good without a productive outcome, coming together, imagining future. Okay, so the only bad thing about WeWork is they don't have production. They always talk and write things, and they feel so good. And they keep burning money to support the illusion. Okay, so I think that self-sustaining uh, ecosystem and that extender is in, it important. Okay, Uber is also expansion. Okay, they use three people. They spend 10 days to get... Okay? Fuck's sake, my group point, I only use one day. Okay, I one day, okay? If I interview something for Ivy Lead, we only ask three questions. Okay, one question. What would you do? I give you five million and one assistant who could can translation. Okay, what would you do when you land the city? Okay, so the topic of answer is, okay, get an HR manager, hire people, rent an office, cut the deal. Okay, there's so many I feel is oh we have to understand the law, we have to get the market strategy. I mean so this is the expansion for being very savaging and also without any mobility restriction. Right now we have to do it smart and do it legally binding. Okay, because when I was starting the, the, the group on thing, people actually burning money in mean, China in Beijing, like a kid. But drinking coffee, they can bullshit their way, get a PPT to VC and get a five million in buck. So the money is so stupid. And right now, look, I, I, I travel back and forth the state. I mean, I talk, I teach in Harvard and MIT. The average entrepreneur, okay, in US is 40 years old. In China, it's like 20 something. It's crazy, but it's not sustainable. Okay, so my opinion of the government is. Because we have global expansion, you can't stop it. Okay, it's it shouldn't stop it because the communication actually incubate improvement. So my idea is like really small, lenient, self-sustaining, self-fulfilling, uh, like small governance is okay. So for my percentage, like fifteen percent less, just like the tax rate, just like the inflation rate. So paying fifteen percent tax, I'm okay. I've always paid taxes, so. I don't support fully de decentralized. And I, I mean, for what you said, Kim, you said you don't actually need them too much, like long arm managing you, okay? Just short arm is fine. I just add your WeChat, by the way. I mean, I can't find, I can't find you, okay? You are at the top of the influencers. <laughs> oh, WeChat? No, no, no. I mean, you think LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. Oh, I, I am with WeChat with, with uh, Xi'an, so, yeah. Are we? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, come on! Yes, I remember now, I remember now, yes. All right. Oh, okay. yeah. 
I, I can't find you on LinkedIn either, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm like, uh, I have to talk to, like, the, the <laughs> Jeff yeah. Hoffman. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. interesting. So what's, the, what's on, in the future for Run the World? Uh, well, uh, right now we, or I think the, the, the trend we see is pretty consistent. Like, uh, events will keep, there's still going to be virtual events even after COVID. Um, yes. uh, obviously, I think there's, still going to be in-person events, um, yes. which it should be. Uh, that's probably going to be focusing more on people connecting to each other, uh, maybe hosting at a destination that's ideal, maybe like a tropical area that's, that's, that's fun. <laughs> Combine with some travel and people come there, yeah. they learn a little bit, they make friends, they bond, they drink. I think those are great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When it comes to more just like massively uh, expressing, expressing certain messages, that's probably easier if you do it virtually and, and just have more people you know, hearing those information faster. Uh, I think there's probably going to be a lot of consistent virtual events for for, for, the, for the purpose of like you know sharing information, uh, and then there's still going to be in-person events for the sake of having a good time and make, making friends and bonding. Uh, so I think those will be really really useful. And we right now are still focusing on virtual events. We still still think there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and then there's some discussion about hybrid, which is an event that has both the virtual piece and the physical piece. I think for, for us, uh, we are embracing that, um, but right now the exact format of what is a hybrid uh, event uh, remains to be, uh, I guess, determined. Uh, there's a different type of format. One of them is like you have a large event that has both virtual and physical, meaning you are live streaming all the talks uh, from the uh, physical venue and online everybody can follow that. Uh, that's one format. And the other format is they say, let's have like one exclusive in person where people can connect kind of like a World Economic Forum, uh, but then they have the content being able to share maybe to, to other people, uh, or, or, or maybe they have a virtual one that's focusing on content, you know, three times a year, followed by a physical one that's focusing on close net community, maybe one time a year. So that's another yeah. format. Uh, there's yeah. another format of hybrid, which is saying, uh, let's have, you know, uh, regional centers uh, so one conference may have 10 regional centers and people just show up physically uh, to those regional centers where they can meet people locally and then they all watch the same content uh, virtually. So there's different format that people have been testing and experimenting. Uh, I don't really know if we know the answer, which one is the right one. Uh, so we're trying to like embrace all of them um, if we can. Um, yeah, and then in terms of the employees, I think I've learned a lot from hiring people remotely. I think it's a, a personally, it works great for me. I'm able to get better talent um, that, you know, otherwise I don't have to compete against Facebook, Google every time. Um, I'm yeah. able to get talent better, uh, actually also at a more economically efficient way uh, for company our skill. So yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't see any cons for a company like me. Uh, and I only see benefit uh, for, for me to yeah. hire internationally. So I think that that is going to be uh, continued as well. Mm. It's interesting what you said about offshoring because uh, my youngest son's an accountant and he's got uh -huh. a team of four or five in, in Sydney, but he's got 30 something in the Philippines and Vietnam and says it works great. You know, he's able to get access to so much more talent. Um, yeah. And yes, it's economical, but uh, but there's more to it than that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Lewis, did I cut you off then or were you about to say something? No, 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 it's fine. I mean, Sorry. Actually, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand what the way it's doing. I mean, particularly interesting because the, okay, to be honest, the way that they grow is really subtle. And of course, because the coronavirus survival is the key. And I mean, personally, I saw like many like entrepreneurs, I mean, see, and I didn't have in too much interaction, but by s listening to what she taught and what she actually doing, I think, mm, yeah, but maybe the coronavirus stopped uh, the business expansion. But I think it's moving on the right direction. Mm. Mm. Uh, Kim, what, what's your thought? Uh, I guess post pandemic, okay. do you see any changes in your business? Uh, the, the, in some ways, financially, the pandemic has been extra good for us. For but I, I'm not comfortable with saying that, but it is the truth. Um, they say Australia has handled, you know, handled the pandemic very well. I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, we had very severe shutdowns, um, but and our chief health officers, I feel, should have been called chief COVID officers, 
because they weren't thinking about other health things. Um, one anecdotal story I say is I've been in business over 40 years and you can think of all the things that can happen in business. We've had marriage breakups, we've had marriages, we've had children coming, we've had on three occasions people die tragically, staff members, but we've never had a suicide in our broader network. And since, pan, since COVID, we've had four, not our own staff, but our clients or client staff. Mm-hmm. Now, people could say that's just a coincidence. To go 40 years with none and have four in just over a year, that's not a coincidence. Uh, the damage that's been done to children that have got been forced to mask up, um, you know, not, not being able to go to school, not getting a lot of those social cues, I think is going to have an effect beyond where, where we know. Uh, the tragedy of elderly people dying alone and not having family being there for them is, is not not assessed, not taken into. There's just this mantra of shut everything down, shut everyone down. And Australia had a relatively low debt, uh, government debt position, and we spent about a half a trillion dollars in handouts and, and what have you over the last 18 months, two years. And I'm not convinced that it couldn't have been done more effectively and more efficiently. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going on with a bit of a rant in, in that regard, but it is something that, that bothers me a lot. And I, I'd say that out of my broader family, I'm probably the only one that feels this way. I don't think my wife or Wiki feel this way. Um, but you know, financially, it's been good. We've been able to support all of our businesses, our client businesses through it. Uh, not one of them has failed as a result. Um, so that's a, that's a positive. Um, and we're well positioned to be able to provide working capital finance for our clients going forward. So, so that's good. Um, but, but none of our clients are in hospitality and restaurants, so that's not in our space. And a lot of them have been really hard. And on a very local basis in our city, some of them were just starting to open up again and just got wiped out by a flood. Um, so that's quite tragic as well. Uh, it doesn't sound positive, um, but I've, I've been quite concerned about that. What's it like in the U? What part of the US are you in? Delamore. I think what, what, a... what state are you in? Have I lost you? Uh, you muted. Yeah. Sorry, I just muted myself. Uh, there's some yeah. nice. Yeah. What What state are you in in the US? So what What is it? What state? Where, where, where about say you're based in the US? Uh, I'm in uh, Silicon Valley, so um, right. next to both, basically, Sim City. All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Fremont, that sort of area. I've been to Fremont. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. it is really close to Fremont, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, like, do we, can we uh, cons- like, conclude a little bit and then yeah. we can talk to <laughs> um, Jimmy and then we can talk after because I think it's still work coding, okay? So okay. <laughs> I need to do the homework because the CEO okay. is here and the course is the same. So okay. I think this is really nice. I think uh, most of the focus for horses right now directed to what happened in Europe, which is unfortunate. Mm. So I think uh, the topic that we have is a little bit uh, comparing to that hum- humanity thing is quite small, but I think we come to agree uh, that actually the question about being surviving in the digital age, I think is a matter of the founders feeling, right? If they use the right platform, the right partner, actually they can mitigate the risk and expand mm-hmm. it in a very effective way. For the government mm-hmm. part, I think we both like all understand that we don't want too much, okay, restriction or regulated because the regulation itself, if they cannot keep up what is evoluting on the way, it will, actually hurdle and kill the, in, the, the incubation of innovation of advancement. So I stand my, my point. So I, I, I think the minimal uh, governing and some of the people are actually uh, cannot catch up the digitalization. Put it one really example. Even for now, everyone is doing mobile payment. I still see some old people can't even understand mobile payment when they go to the clinic. Okay, mm. so government is actually connecting with the people who cannot catch up first and also paying the infrastructure 
for the privatization, like the, the infrastructure to police. But, okay, I would like to extend an uh, invitation for seeing, because we know each other for quite long. Actually, I'm being uh, sitting on most of the uh, young international, starting from UN, World Bank, and also ASEAN, European, G20, YEA, APEC. Okay. How, I, I actually talk to Frank quite often because they want to spin up something for ASEAN. So, yeah. So my family is quite diverse too. So I think by knowing Kim, I mean, Kim is really humble. And I think Kim, uh, if you have anything that we can actually enable, I'm actually, I feel like right now the, the challenge itself and then to the audience or to the people who actually seeing the payback, I think right now is opportunity. Okay. The opportunity is that try to minimize your, your business, not to outsource them. Okay. Because people, the organization structure is fragmentized. Okay. So all I'm a company, all the unit, I restricted them only work for people for five or six. And then if they talk too much, that is something happened for the communication or the platform they use. Okay. So in order to thank you for you for run the world, I, I, I really thinking it's blessed. Okay. Because we still have the um, luxury to talk and having our own business running. When I look at, oh, and I talk to a, a portfolio in Ukrainian, uh, the couples come to my son's birthday one year ago in China. I actually so regret that I didn't, didn't insist they have to stay in China because they can remote. Right now, they actually, the, the co-founder actually pregnant eight months now in Keith. Okay. Oh. So I think being too optimistic is good for business. But for me, I'm super optimistic. I'm sadly pessimistic when it comes to risk management. Okay, so I, I move it before the coronavirus or digital because I like cryptocurrency. I like like blockchain, but I can sense the government actually capture because there's two power, right? Being super mobile and being said, so I, I already move all the operation to the places where welcome like crypto and also um, remote working. Some of the country, they don't like remote working because they want to make sure that everyone was working along to the goal of the government. Okay. So being optimistic and sadly super pessimistic about risk management and business continuity. Okay. So we can start another section, but I'm closing the stop streaming right now. Mm -hmm.